Hey everyone, so I just want to get into this lecture and um, pretty much just have it uploaded for you as we speak. You know the announcements, they came out on Sunday, they are on your Blackboard already. So let's get um, <laughs> to this as soon as possible. So this week we move on to chapter two. Chapter two is on measuring crime and criminal behavior. Last week we were on chapter one. Chapter one was an overview of crime and criminology. Um, this week, just be aware that every single week from last week until the end of the semester, there are learning objectives you should make sure that you're keeping in mind um, after you have read or after you have listened to the lecture. I'm not gonna go over them, but you can find them in your Blackboard, you can find them in the text, and you can find them at the end of the PowerPoints. Sound good? So let's get right into it. Um, again, chapter two um, is on measuring crime and criminal behavior. The first section of chapter two begins with categorizing and measuring crime and criminal behavior. So gauging the extent of a problem or gauging the extent of a crime means discovering how much of it there actually is, where and when it occurs the most often, and among which social categories it occurs most frequently. Now, it's going to help if we have knowledge of the patterns and trends of the problem over time. Why questions, so where you see that I have the quotations around the why, why questions are those questions that ask kind of like, why does this crime occur? Why is this crime increasing? Why is this crime decreasing, right? Who commits this crime and so on? Um, so why questions can be answered and addressed adequately after we have a reliable data source or reliable data about the extent of the problem, about the extent of the crime. So there are major data sources that can help us answer these why questions. Major data sources are grouped into three broad categories. These categories are official statistics, victimization survey data, and self-reported data. Official statistics, this is the most basic category of official statistics from calls that were made to the police by victims, by witnesses, and by crimes discovered by police on patrol, okay? Victimization survey data and self-reported data are two major categories of official crime data, sorry, the police. <laughs> So um, victimization, victimization survey data and um, self-reported um, data are two major categories of official crime data that consists of information about arrests, information about convictions, information about correctional populations. And if you remember from the last lecture, and I hope that last lecture was clear, um, and I'm hoping I'm being clear here, but Correctional populations are those populations that are imprisoned. They are those populations that are um, on probation and on parole, okay? So other major categories of official um, crime data consist of information about similar things, right? So about arrests, about convictions, about correctional population. The Uniform Crime Reports, right? So these are reports that count crime officially, right? So these are a primary source of official crime statistics in the United States that are collected annually, that are reported on annually. They're, compi they're compiled specifically by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, AKA the FBI, okay? The UCR reports crimes known to the nation's police, known to the nation's sheriff departments, and the number of arrests made by these specific agencies. Um, federal crimes, you need to remember, are not reported 
in the UCR reports. However, other crimes, other crimes, and I'm just like making sure I remember, but other crimes are, okay? But not the federal crimes, okay? The UCR reports the number of each crime reported to the police as well as their rate of occurrence, so how often they are occurring. The rate of a given crime is the actual number of reported um, crimes standardized by some unit of the population. Um, to obtain a crime rate, we divide the number of reported crimes in the specific state by its population and multiply it by a quotient of 100,000. You will get how to do that later on in the semester, okay? Um, but if you have taken a stats class, you should already know how to do that, okay? So um, I just went over that. Um, crimes can be separated into two categories, two broad categories. The first category is part one offenses, and then we have part two offenses. Part one offenses specifically are, consist of four violent um, types of crimes and four property offenses, okay? Those eight, I'm gonna list off to you right now. So the first four are violent crimes, the next four are linked to property offensive, offenses, okay? So the four violent crimes are homicide, assault, forcible rape, and robbery, okay? And then the four, um, the four property offenses are, so you already have the four violent, are larceny slash theft, burglary, motor vehicle theft, and arson, okay? Part two offenses, offense, sorry guys, offense, offenses, okay, are less serious um, offenses, which are recorded based on arrests made rather than cases reported to the police. So here we have um, a figure, and I'll really, and most of the time I will grab the same exact figures out of the textbook and just upload them to um, the PowerPoint. Here we have the 2017 FBI crime plot. Here um, we are learning, or we have see a figure of how often a violent crime occurs. So these, and this is in relation to part one offenses. This is all in relation to part one. This is not part two, has nothing to do with part two. So how often a violent crime will occur, how often a property crime will occur, okay? So one, so a violent crime overall, and this includes all four of the violent parts of part one offenses, right? will occur every 24.6 seconds. A murder though, which is a part one offense, right, will occur every 30.5 minutes, okay? A burglary on the other hand, which still is a part one offense, will occur every 22.6 seconds. And you guys could do the rest on your own. And I would actually, I'd say pause here and do those on your own, okay? Your book then goes on to cleared offenses, okay? If a person is arrested and charged, okay, for a part one offense, the UCR, the Uniform Crime Re Records, right? records the crime as cleared by arrest. A crime may also be cleared by exceptional means when the police have identified a suspect and have enough evidence to support arrest, but he or she could not be taken into custody immediately or at all. Okay. 
And again, this figure is pulled from um, the textbook. Okay, so here you have a figure of the percentages of crimes cleared by arrest or exceptional means in 2017. And I actually should have said this when I saw the, when we saw the first figure, but these are from 2017. We are living in different times. Data changes yearly, okay? Right now, as from what I know, we have complete data for 2018. Hence why this book has been updated um, recently. So there is a fourth one either coming out or already out. Okay. So keep that in mind. Okay. So again, this is the percentages of crimes cleared by arrest um, or exceptional means in 2017. It is a bar graph. In the blue, you have the violent crimes. In the green, you have the property crimes. Okay. And I'll do one or two of these right now for you. Okay. So in regards to murder and non-negligent manslaughter, okay, which is a violent crime, okay, 61.6% .6 of those were cleared by arrest or exceptional means in 2017. On the other hand, let's do rape, okay, 34.5% um, of those percent 34.5% of those crimes were cleared by arrest or exceptional means in 2017. Let's move on to crime trends, okay? One thing about the uniform crime reports is that they're very useful for tracking trends. Okay, they're very useful for, you know, scoping out patterns, etc. Any explanation for major fluctuation in crime rates requires that we have an understanding of the historical context around um, those crimes in that specific year. It requires that we have social, political, economic, and demographic understanding of things that are unfolding during those times and processes, okay? Um, any effect, okay, of a particular process on a crime may be immediate or it may be felt a decade down or so down the line, okay? Such as economic policy, um, decisions that later affect job creation in the future, okay? Um, an example, clear example of this, if any of you live in Lawrence, if any of you live in Lowell, if any of you live in Salem, and I'm linking this to economic policy changing, um, not just crime, right, but changing the areas around them, and they are felt later on. But when factories, when mill towns leave or get destroyed or they suddenly stop existing, you see the change that happens in these communities, whether it be an uptick in crime, you know, an uptick in joblessness, etc. Okay, that's what our authors are trying to get us to understand at this moment. Okay. You should never take national statistics at face value unless you are sure, unless you are certain of the quality. Quality meaning you know how that data was collected. You know that the individuals collecting those data um, are aware of their biases, everyone's bias, and et cetera, right? You know that the quality of the data is good and national reporting we should keep in mind, right? A specific crime statistics was terrible in the early part of the 20th century, okay? The homicide rate started to a steep climb after the Volstead Act. So our chapter then goes into a little bit of history, right? Because context is always important, especially in criminology. The, ho the homicide rate started a steep climb after the Volstead Act, which prohibited the production and sale of alcohol in the 1920s as gangs fought over the lucrative, now illegal alcohol market. 
the rate started to fall with the repeal of the Volstead Act in 1933, which effectively removed criminals from the alcohol business. When most young men, the age, specifically the age category that commits the lion's share of the crime, um, were in uniform and overseas, crime showed a sharp rise when they actually returned. And then when they settled, um, it showed a slight decrease during the periods of 1950s and the 1960s. Okay. The late 1960s through the mid 1970s was a period of tumultuous change in American society. You should be thinking right now about what is changing in the 1960s and the 1970s, right? There's opposition to the Vietnam War. There is the civil rights movement going on. There is the feminist movement going on. There is the women's movement going on. So fundamental values of American society um, were changing, okay? And again, there were groups that were be being treated as second-class citizens. When values and norms are questioned, and that's what all of these movements are doing, right? Questioning things. When values and norms are questioned, they become weaker in their ability to regulate behavior, okay? Crack cocaine is also easier to make at this time. And sorry, I didn't mean to laugh at that, but crack cocaine is also easier to make at this time. It's easier to conceal um, and sell, right? So we're selling all these things, we're creating them, etc. Again, crack cocaine is easier to make, conceal, and sell than barrels and bottles of whiskey. So crack dealing is more of an equal opportunity enterprise than supplying illegal alcohol was. Numerous young gangbangers took advantage of the opportunity for easy money in places where jobs were scarce, sparking a decade-long street war with like-minded individuals. Okay. Um, the decrease in homicide rate, in the homicide rate in the early 1990s, can be attributed to several factors, including a large decrease in crack, the crack market and in gang warfare as territories became um, consolidated by the strong pushing um, out of the weak, okay? And your book goes into these um, crime trends. Here is another figure that is pulled out from our textbook. It's specifically on the murder rates in the United States in um, the 1900s to 2017. Again, we have our most accurate, most full data up until that point, okay? So you can see the spikes. You can also see the decline. One thing I find, um, one thing I'm very curious to see is um, where we would be in 2020. And the reason I'm curious to see is I want to know whether or not I'm accurate or if I'm thinking about these things. Um, if my ideas about crime in 2020, based on what I see, um, is accurate or not. And I'm not going to tell you what I think I see, but um, I can't wait until I see the 2019 data. Okay. So now let's go on to um, problems with the uniform crime reports, okay? The UCR data significantly underrepresents the actual number of crime events in the United States each year. That's an issue. Federal crimes such as a highly cost, as federal crimes such as highly um, costly white collar crimes such as stark market fraud, um, hazardous waste dumping, tax evasion, and fake claims for professional services are not included in the UCR reports. Remember why these things are not included at the beginning of the chapter. They are what? What kinds of crimes are not included in these reports? Okay. 
Crimes committed in the jurisdiction of non-participating law enforcement agencies are also not included in the uniform crime reports. Okay. Um, crime data may be falsified by police departments for political reasons. Okay. Policy can influence things. The UCR even underreports crimes that are not known to the police because of the FBI's hierarchy rule. The hierarchy rule require, requires police to report only the highest, most serious offenses committed in multiple offenses, um, in multiple offense single incidents um, to the FBI and to ignore all of the others. Okay. There are problems with comparing international crime rates as well, okay? Problems such as the hierarchy rule and the different ways in which different nations record crime make it extremely difficult to compare crime rates across the nation. Different nations define different crimes differently. So arson in, arson's kind of defined the same everywhere. Um, rape, okay? Um, rape is defined differently, not only amongst the states in the United States, but um, um, around the globe, okay? The ages, you know, our definitions of consent, etc. okay? There is the problem of the efficiency, accuracy, capacity, and slash or honesty of the police in various countries in recording and reporting their crimes, especially when it comes to homicide, okay? 